David Concanon was apparently supposed to be on the last Ocean Gate expedition, but didn't go on it due to a last minute conflict that came up. And that fact isn't necessarily brand new. For people who've been following Ocean Gate, they know that David has been on a ton of different interviews immediately following the incident. But there's a new interview that just came out between David Concanon and Wayne King. It's almost two hours long, but I still kept about an hour of it, and you can listen to it for the rest of this video. But before that, I just want to give you a heads up of what you can expect. David basically reiterates how much he hates the US Navy, the Coast Guard, and the US government. But the reason why this interview is so interesting is because he delves into a lot of topics related to Ocean Gate. He talks about his theory about what the tapping sound was, the Titan safety procedures, and why so many dives were canceled. He also talks about how it wasn't Stockton Rush that convinced him to go on the sub, but instead it was PH. He was the one that convinced him because apparently PH was saying how he thinks it's safe. David also provides some insights into what he doesn't like about the sub, and he mentions David Lockridge's lawsuit as well. And then of course he provides more details, his perspective, about why Stockton did not get the sub certified. The more I listened to the interview, the more mad I got about the situation. Because as you know, it could have been prevented. And generally, David reminds me of a guy you can get drunk, and he'll tell you everything. I mean, this could have easily been a five-hour discussion. Anyways, here's the edited version. I tried to only include the parts that would be relevant for you, especially if you've been following all the Ocean Gate videos on my channel. I was supposed to make a dive, and my dive got weathered out, and so I didn't I didn't have the opportunity to do so. Stockton Rush had, had felt bad about that, and he had asked me to come back in 2023, guaranteed me a dive. And my job in the sub was to be the the, the uh, subject matter expert on the Titanic and the wreck site, which I know very well. I couldn't say yes to that for a lot of reasons until really the very last minute, middle of April. They left in the beginning of May. But I finally, it worked with my schedule and I was supposed to go on mission five and be on dive one, which was scheduled for June 18th, 2023. And but for a client crisis that arose 36 hours before my departure, you know, I would have been there and probably would have been in the sub. And and um, unlike, you know, Kim Kardashian or whoever else has got a publicist claiming it, I was actually on the dive that day. And because I couldn't go, PH Narjale took my seat. And I've known PH for 25 years and Stockton Rush was piloting and and know him for six. And um, Hamish Harding, who's a trustee of the Explorers Clubs in the sub, and I've known him for not very long, a couple of I met him in the spring and we corresponded. Um, and I didn't know the father and son, but I did know everyone else. And I knew every about half the people on the boat. We consider Ocean Gate kind of a family, even, if, you know, we've all worked together for years. Before they were even on the tarmac, ready to fly out, I had learned at about 3 o'clock in the morning, mountain time where I live, 6.30 a.m. on site at the Titanic Monday morning, that the Navy had picked up acoustic uh, data uh, that was consistent with an implosion. And I, this was hearsay. This was this came to me because somebody heard it, somebody in the private sector had heard it from somebody else who had heard it from somebody else who had heard it from Woods Hole, who supposedly had heard it from the Navy. And it was just as as likely that a, a, a dead sub without power had crashed into the bottom as it was. And, you know, there was a loud sound what it was exactly was was undetermined but it was either an implosion or something else and i woke up to that i took i got about 90 minutes sleep the first night and i woke up to that at, at uh, three in the morning so all day monday i was hearing it from various sources and others were hearing it from various sources and the navy would not confirm it we kept asking them because i'm in direct communications with the boat i'm speaking to stockton white stockton's wife they didn't know this information but i wasn't going to call them up and say uh you know I'm really sorry your husband's dead uh, i heard a rumor based on a somebody said to somebody to said to somebody who knows somebody else that your husband's dead so you know you might as well come in 
I wasn't going to do that. And the the Coast Guard and the Navy never told the families until um, after they found out from CNN on Thursday. Can you think of, can you think of any reason why they would have why they would have not been in touch? Well, they were in touch. They the the U.S. Coast Guard was speaking to Kyle. He was they only wanted to talk to one person, and and I was on all the emails, and and OceanGate would send an email out. Kyle would send an email. I was copied, and then the Navy would send or the Coast Guard would send something back, and they would take me off, and they back put me on back, take me off. And it was like like ping pong, um, but what the what the Coast Guard told Kyle was that we picked up some acoustic signatures and it's inconclusive and it's just we're not sure what it is, and that was communicated to the family members of the which was principally uh, Wendy Rush, the wife and daughter of the two Pakistanis were on board. Uh, PH's family was not there. And Hamish's family was not there, but that's all they told them. Just inconclusive, vague, never use the word implosion. That they, they, they heard something, but they're not sure what it is. And then, you know, they've got assets in the area that they can't really talk about because nobody's read a Tom Clancy novel from the 1980s and knows about the Sosis network. I mean, come on. It, you know, so they just didn't. They didn't say anything, but they certainly acted like they they uh, didn't have any sense of urgency. It was very, very frustrating for the British because they had two British, three British citizens on board and they wanted to get there. And it was very frustrating for the French because P.H. Nargelet was a French naval commander and they wanted to get there. And they didn't see any reason to slow down and they never did. And they went, despite the United States telling them not to because we asked them to. That's part of the story that hasn't been told. And it's part of the story. I know that the Navy and the Coast Guard don't want to be told, but you know, there's two sides so to me. There's the, there's the up to June 18th side of the story, part of the story, not side part. And there's the after five o'clock in the evening on June 18th to now. You know, and and I know for a fact that the that the Navy and the Coast Guard don't want to talk about their feckless efforts, um, and I know they're not happy with me because I went on television and called them out for it. And but look, the reality is, if it weren't for the tapping and the reporting of the tapping. And the, nobody willing to not want people not saying we're going to keep this a secret. The U.S. government never would have actually made an effort. They didn't actually make an effort until Tuesday because tapping sounds were starting to be heard overnight. And they were at regular intervals, first every four hours, then every two hours, then every one hour, then every half hour at 12 o'clock and six o'clock in a very rhythmic way. And that's what alarmed the U.S. government. Because members of the Explorers Club and members of the public, we wouldn't keep that quiet. And the British didn't keep it quiet. And the Canadians didn't keep it quiet. And the French didn't keep it quiet. And the Americans were forced to act. So we it took President Biden to to get to order the the uh, mobilization of Magellan. And that was Tuesday afternoon. There's still time, but it was time was running out. And then within an hour, he canceled it. And then later that evening, not too much longer, Rolling Stone came out with a story publishing leaked emails from earlier in the day from the Department of Homeland Security. And that's when, that was the oh shit moment for the US government when they said, uh oh. And they called everybody in and said, okay, everybody come to the party. But stop in Woods Hole, Massachusetts on your way or something stupid. It was just, and I just watched this. I watched the clock wind down and, and I knew that the whole time I knew about the implosion data, but that didn't, you know, an imploded sub doesn't 
tap rhythmically on a regular basis. And so there's 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 no conclusive information and you have to act on the the feeling that these people are alive and, and it's a rescue operation until it isn't. And that's what we did. So so the first major sounds that they heard <clears throat> they meaning the the navy or the u.s government or um was what what later they would call the implosion is that correct that's correct and someone in the navy did a victory lap on thursday and or the and said wow we knew the whole time and then somebody smarter shut them down and said stop yeah, don't was- say that you know um but yeah so the all day Monday, I was getting people were saying, and, and the interesting thing, Wayne, is that I kept saying, please confirm it, please confirm it, please confirm it, please confirm it, so that I can tell the the boat and Wendy so that, you know, and we'll stand down. Nobody, I was told, okay, at 4.30 Eastern Standard Time, the United States Coast Guard, the admiral in charge, is going to hold a press briefing in Boston. And he's going to confirm it, confirm that the uh, implosion. I said, okay, I'll. I can't watch it. It wasn't publicized, to, you know. But I did have somebody who was there telling me. And instead of saying that we have this data that in, implies an implosion, they said this is a rescue effort, and we're doing everything possible to rescue these people within ninety six hours. And we're going to search at the surface, an area the size of the state of Connecticut. And there's a seven mile wreck site on the bottom that we have to search. And we're bringing in all assets and we're going to get there in time. And I was sitting there saying, what? Are you stupid? What are you, are you dishonest? Are you, why are you lying? You're not needing to search an area the size of Connecticut on the surface because the sub has a has a satellite pinger on it that pings immediately and shows its location as soon as it comes up. And oh, by the way, we have private companies tasking satellites that are looking at the surface right now. Number one. Number two, you, the wreck site's five square miles, not seven. And you don't have to search five square miles on the bottom. You just go to the last known position, which the Coast Guard doesn't do ever in an underwater search because they don't know how to do it. You go to last known position and you follow the current. If there's nothing beneath where we last heard them and they we last heard them almost near the bottom, and I have the coordinates, Admiral, then you go to that position and you move in the current, the direction of the current, which incidentally runs almost always north or northeast at about a knot or a half a knot, and you'll find debris or you'll find the sub. And that area that I've been in in a sub is as flat as the Kmart parking lot. And if there's something the size of Titan on the bottom, it's going to stick up and you'll see it on your forward facing sonar. So I was screaming mad and I just, and Oh, and let's talk about the 3000 meter ROVs that you sent all assets. And the other guys that have been on the tarmac now for at that point in time, about eight hours and you wouldn't let them take off. And so that was maddening, but that's how this role, that's how, that's how the week played out. And then the ping pong would take me off the emails, all that other stuff. And I finally, I went on national television. I didn't, I still not really clear on who I was, what shows I was on because I just picked, I was getting hundreds of media requests and I just picked the next two that were closest in time to this problem that had a national audience. And I went on them back to back. And, and that's, that's how the week, the week rolled out. We were stonewalled by the U S helped tremendously by the British. Canadians were doing their part. French were phenomenal. Um, Other countries I won't go into. But at the highest levels, at the you know the, the the defense minister in France, the prime minister in Britain, U.S. senators, uh, U.S. congressmen, uh, just were helping and trying to move mountains put in place by the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Coast Guard. 
it got so bad that we ended up having a U.S. congressman on every communication and every phone call with the Navy because they knew that they're speaking to a United States congressman, senator, and that he's, he's part of the conversation. He's on the email. You can't take him off the emails. And that's how that went that week. And when the French got there, uh, they were turned around and sent the other way. Pick up the phone. Congressman calls the admiral. Where are they going? Why are they leaving? Watching on computer on the AIS tracking system. They turn around, come back. Oh, they turn their AIS off. Tell them to turn it back on. Put it back on and brought them back to the site. And it was just this 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 um, a battle, an unnecessary battle, if you're trying to save people's lives. And then, you know, they found what they found. So I know some people were sighing relief because they weren't responsible for the deaths of five people. What was the whole uh, uh, talk about the tapping that they heard? All of that came post, uh, post what they had presumed was the sound of the... Collapse. Right, right. So timeline here is that the sub went down at 9.30 in the morning, Sunday, local Titanic time, local time. It was overdue by about 5 p.m. Weather was, I knew the weather was closing out. It was going to be lousy. You didn't want to do a night recovery and they didn't, they wanted to recover the sub in daylight before the weather got really bad. So they were due up around four or five. And I was called at 6.30 Titanic time saying the sub was overdue. Um, I'm certain the Canadian vessel called the Canadian Coast Guard because they're required by law to do so. And whatever, they were going to send some planes out overnight. And what was happening on the ship was they were waiting the sub's overdue. They had lost contact with it, which is not unusual. Not because there's different th- uh, co- layers of cold water in the in the ocean, and you know you can lose contact because the signal doesn't get above it. And it's happened before many times. When I did my dives, I would actually turn the radio off because it was st- static and white noise. They didn't have a radio on Titan. They had different mechanism, but losing communications is not a big deal. Losing tracking is, and they had lost both. So, but they thought, okay, let's give them their time. And if they're not up by this time, then, you know, we'll start to uh, make phone calls. Call Dave, call the Canadians. And then they were expecting the sub to come up though. And they were also expecting that if they had lost power, which is not common, but it is, it's not impossible. There were squibs on the, the landing part of the sub that would dissolve and they would detach the hull from the heavy part and the sub would float to the surface. And there, that has happened once before on Titanic where the squibs have had to fire. And they would pop up at night and uh, or early the next morning and the beacon would immediately transmit to the satellite and they'd have a fix and they would just go and pick them up. So that was what the expectation was on the site. Wasn't until the next morning when they were starting to really get, they were worried, but they were really worried the next morning and they didn't know about the implosion data. So they're hoping because the, the squibs are set anywhere from 12 to 24 hours. And Stockton likes to send them for 24 hours. Scott likes to do it for 12. So they thought, okay, nine o'clock, they're going to dissolve maybe at the earliest PM and they'll be up at midnight or worst case scenario. It'll be sometime tomorrow morning and they'll pop up by lunchtime. That was what was happening on site. Then they didn't come to the surface and then people were scared. And so 
Then at two o'clock Tuesday morning, local time, the tapping started. And the tapping was heard by multiple ships in the area that are listening. They have you can you have the ability, that's how you communicate with the sub, you listen for it to communicate. And they were picking it up. And the Canadians had dropped sauna buoys, and they were picking it up on the sauna buoys on Tuesday morning. So in the timeline of events, this isn't a lot of time that had gone by. It wasn't days and days. It was hours. So the sauna buoys started picking it up overnight Tuesday in the darkness and in the morning. And they communicated out to the British, the Americans, that were picking up tapping. And that there's a hope that the crew's alive. I first learned about the tapping from the British Ministry of Defense. And then it was being, but no, never from the Americans. And the ship was telling me, but never the Coast Guard or the, or the Navy. And they were, that's when I said they kind of had their oh shit moment because, uh-oh, we thought it imploded. Now we hear tapping. And it was becoming more common and more, and it was rhythmic the whole time. And it was, it was, it was more than just whale sounds or at least to the people that were hearing it. They actually recorded it on the receivers that they were using and they sent the recording to the manufacturer of the receiver and said, could you please tell us this ocean gate did this? If you hear anything and if you do hear anything, what do you hear? And the manufacturer came back and said, well, we were able to isolate this and it sounds like somebody's tapping at regular intervals. So they were proofing it out. They were they were putting that information out. Department of Homeland Security took it seriously. The British took it seriously. The French took it seriously. And we in the private sector were not going to let this go by. So I reached out to a congressman I had access to, another congressman, uh, two that we had access to the families were reaching out we were marshalling our support and eventually there was a big blockage there was probably three people that were responsible in the coast guard navy and u.s air force and at about three o'clock mountain time tuesday afternoon i got a call on my cell phone from the secretary of the air force who i don't personally know nor did I give my cell phone number to him. But he called me and said, what's the name of the blockage? Who is it? Gave him the name, gave him the phone number, said, I'll take care of it. About 15 minutes later, we got a phone call from the Situation Room at the White House. Sitting with President Biden, he's going to authorize Magellan. Can we please have Magellan's phone number? Okay, stand by. They give him the phone number. Five minutes after that, Magellan says, we've been mobilized. Thanks to the president. Just spoke to two Navy admirals. We're, we're on, on our way. My wife and I hugged, high-fived, kissed. We hugged Goldie, our teenager who was bringing us food, went to walk the dog, came back an hour later after walking the dog, getting some fresh air, first time in two days. And uh, Magellan's on the phone saying we would, we were just canceled. They just stood us down. Uh, and we were shocked. And then, fortunately, the Rolling Stone story came out. And the Rolling Stone story came out a couple hours later with leaked Department of Homeland Security emails from that morning saying there's hope. And then it became a political issue where they had to do something. So by that time, on Tuesday, the 3,000-meter ROVs got up to the site, got squashed. The first one got imploded. And... They put the second one in and they were kind of hovering around at 3,000 meters just trying to see if they could hear anything or see anything down another 1,000 meters in the darkness. And that was unsuccessful. So they finally mobilized an ROV that had a camera and a set of lights, but not the ability to really work and took, and put that on a ship back in Canada and sent it 400 miles out. That arrived Wednesday night. And that's what we did Wednesday. We were still trying to get Magellan in, still pushing, still pushing. Uh, eventually, Magellan finally got to Canada, but they were getting monkeyed around with by the Coast Guard. They didn't have a boat for them. We got them a boat. Yeah, this isn't easy to do. This is this is like, there's very, very few assets in the entire world that can actually do these things. 
But every owner of every private asset that we asked that was able to help did. Everyone said yes. The people that were unable to help because they were too far away or their equipment was in, in dry dock or, you know, it was, it wasn't, it was disassembled in the warehouse. They did everything they could do to help. Private jet flew sonar from the West coast to the East coast to put on an ROV in case it could be used. And it was amazing to see the effort that the private sector put in for people they either didn't know, knew and disagreed with, or knew and just said, you know, we'll help. Everyone said yes, everybody. And the juxtaposition between the government and the private sector was just stunning and difficult to handle. And and we were all just trying to get there in time. But I, I, I'm co- totally confused when it, with the, sort of the timeline on all this and how how it was that uh, you know you, you had the sounds of an implosion and then tapping later do you feel as if they may have survived some incident in the beginning no i don't feel that they survived some incident in the beginning what i feel and this is this is rampant speculation a hunch yeah. Sure. Theory, un, un, you know, without any evidence to support it, I feel like another government with another submersible didn't have to be as deep as the Titanic was messing with us. I feel like potentially they were just if they were just testing our response. You know, if you know anything about war, you know that an injured soldier takes far more resources to deal with than a dead soldier. So if you want to test your enemy's ability to react to a certain event, for example, the disabling of a nuclear submarine, why not mess with them and see how they would respond to the loss of Titan? Particularly because, hey, you probably know what the U.S. Navy knows. You probably know they're, they're acting as though because look, the Russians can figure out that three is less than four. They know that. And in my own personal opinion, and, and that's based on, I was on the the academic Mstislav Keldish with the mere submersibles that are owned by the Russian Academy of Sciences. I had chartered the ship and the subs for a Titanic expedition when the Kursk disaster took place, when the nuclear submarine Kursk mm-hmm. had a torpedo that went off in the tube. And Putin never left his dacha and and said, well, they're all dead. I'm not going to leave my vacation until the tapping started, until the next day with the 30 sailors that had survived the explosion were tapping. And in my opinion, why not give President Biden his cursed moment? Why not pay him back for some of the pain you're being you're suffering in the Ukraine or, you know, with the embargo or something? Why not test your enemy's ability to respond to a tragedy such as a, or, you know, a disabled submersible, a disabled nuclear sub, and see what they'll do. See who they send. See how long it takes. I would do it if I was, if it was my enemy and I was in a, in a position of, um, if this opportunity had been handed to me as a military leader that was tasked with it. But that's just me speculating and wondering. I don't know what the tapping was. I just know, I know what it was. I don't know what was doing it. Right, right. So, well, <clears throat> you know, whether whether or not that's the explanation, uh, at least uh, there's a, a rational, uh, you know, there are probably several rational um, reasons why someone might think that they were, still looking to be helped even after the uh the explosion had taken place well i don't i based on what i know about the condition of the submersible when it was found i believe it imploded when they lost contact right I, and that's well informed based on my knowledge and experience with deep submersibles i've been to this site i've been to this place on the bottom of the ocean that's knowing what the communications were as the sub was descending and knowing when they last communicated, what the 
routines and the procedures are. I believe that the sub imploded at about a depth of 10,000 feet, about 2,000 feet before the bottom. And that's based on the dispersal of the wreckage. And remember, I led the the project and the expeditions to find and recover the Apollo rocket engines from eight Apollo missions. And I had 105 people working for me on that. So we had to study where the Saturn V, the S1Cs first stages would land and then what would happen to them and how they would be dispersed as they fell to 14,000 feet of depth. So I don't even through that exercise. And we found, you know, like the engines from Apollo 11, the first hour, the first day of the, after doing a search expedition two years earlier. So I kind of had a good idea of how to find things underwater. But I'd like to start a little bit uh, earlier with uh, sort of the the the, the pre-accident uh, yep. situation. And at least in part because, you know, you had a visit uh, from uh, David Pogue, who was a uh, with CBS Sunday morning, and he went and visited and uh, uh, did a tour of uh, of um, the the submersible, and uh, you know, it, during that he said, you know, the crew fosters a culture of safety, and there are seven redundant safety systems for returning to the surface, and. You know, he, he seemed to suggest that uh, that despite the fact that there were some uh, sort of uh, innovative uh, things done uh, about uh, to to set up uh, uh, systems on the on the submersible, that that there was there was attention paid to safety. I, what's your sense about all that? Well, that was part of what I was asked to help with. And David, I was out with David. David and I, I was supposed to dive with David last year and the CBS team. I was supposed to be their subject matter expert on their dive. And David, you know, I he did, he actually, they they weren't, we got weathered out, so he couldn't do a Titanic dive, but they he got kind of like a consolation dive. And I didn't bother to go on that because I knew it was, you know, it was a couple hours. And they they couldn't get off the platform because there was an electrical issue. And electronics and saltwater don't like each other. And when you add pressure, there's even more of a problem. So David's right that there were all of these procedures put in place. You know, there's been criticism of the Titanic, you know, only made 13 dives out of 100 tries or something like that. Well, the reason it only made 13 dives out of 100 tries is either because on the other 983, there were weather issues or there were equipment issues and they canceled the dive because they had a matrix of risk that, and they assigned points to different variables. And if you got to 50 points, they canceled the dive. And every single person on the boat had the authority and the ability to cancel a dive. Everyone, the cook could cancel a dive. And they had these these meetings at 7 a.m. for an hour and 7 p.m. for an hour, ops meetings. They were mandatory. Everybody was required to attend. They would clap and embarrass you if you were late. And they went through a spreadsheet of every single issue that had to be dealt with, every what the fix was, who was responsible for it, and what the timeline was. So every single person knew everything every day. I hated those meetings. I never had one of those meetings when I led an expedition. I couldn't stand them. But at least everybody knew. So there were there were always there was always this attention to safety. Now there were sometimes gremlins in the system. Sometimes the th you know the thrusters would act up. They were consistently acting up. There were, but Stockton was the kind of guy that if one pixel dot on the monitor was out, he would cancel the dive. He would focus on that. But so despite the best preparations, you can still be caught unaware. You know, something can still happen that you don't you don't suspect. And we don't know what caused the sub to implode. There could be 
a million reasons why it did. And I would imagine that all but four of them were unnoticeable. And the four that were noticeable, somebody just didn't see. But it wasn't for lack of effort. Uh, you know, it was interesting that all the criticism that's come out has been about the design of the sub. It's 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 uh, cylindrical and it's made of carbon fiber. And there was a, a lot of conversation and a lot of people who said this will never work. You're going to die. And they stopped talking about it two years ago when they first made dives. And they, they, it was crickets chirping. Because they were successful, you mean? Correct. And then the day the sub went missing or the day after, they all came forward with the chorus of I told you so's. And a lot of them, they never said a word. Really never said a word. I you know, I know Jim had, had some um, opinions about the sub, but they weren't entirely negative mm -hmm. until it, after it went missing. And Neil deGrasse Tyson, I know Neil, and I know Jim. Never said anything to me. He never said anything. I I had conversations with people in 2017, 2018 about, do you think this will work? I had a very serious conversation with P.H. Narjale in 2020 and 1 and 2022. It wasn't Stockton Rush that convinced me the sub was safe. It was P.H. Narjale. And P.H. Narjale is one of five people in the world that's an expert in deep submersibles. And I had my reservations, and I still do. Even before this, I had reservations. There's things about it I didn't like. But P.H. was the one that said, I think it's safe. And P.H. made, of the 13 Titanic dives, he probably was on 11 of them, if not all of them. One of the things that that's that's interesting is there's five ways to die in the sub. Implosion is the best bad outcome, but there's also fire, freezing to death, suffocation, and drowning. So I the, the design was set in stone before I ever came on the scene, and it, it was it, that wasn't going to change. I focused on the other four ways to die in the sub to try and mitigate against those risks. And that's where I put my effort in. And to me, you know, an implosion, if I had if I had to die from an implosion that day, that would have been my choice. Right. If I, right. you know, if, so if you said to me, look, you have five choices, that's, and which is it? Got to pick one, can't. So I worked on the others. And, it, but I have to say, Stockton didn't always follow my advice. I hated and still hate the platform, the launch and recovery system. I call it the spruce goose. I've always called it the spruce goose or just the goose. And everybody knows what I mean when I refer to is the goose up? Did the goose go down? Where's the goose? They all know it. It's not a compliment. And I, and I didn't like the goose because I felt that it added unnecessary steps to the launch and recovery procedure that took extra time, that created extra risk, that were, were, unnecessary and i used to say the problem with the goose is it's not a crane and i prefer putting a sub in the water with a crane and taking it out i never won that argument i, I never stopped making it but i never won and stockton you know he wasn't always right but he was always certain and he was i understand i don't like it when you call it the goose please don't call it the goose in front of the you know the crew and you know, chefs, and, you know, but no, too bad. And, you know, I don't want anybody to think that this is, I feel that this is a good idea, but you know, there was a, there was a safety culture and, and it, it didn't feel like safety theater. It just, but you know, the difference between this year and the last two years though, there is a difference. And, and I, I just feel like, you know, maybe there was some slippage. Maybe, I don't know. I saw, you know, you think about these because I was, I was having nightmares for probably the first six, seven weeks. And these are the things that come to you in the middle of the night. But 
you know, you always kind of rationalize it. I don't know. But David was right. There was a, th there were things about the sub that would give people pause, like the, the PlayStation controller. But then you started to think about it for a while and you're like, well, it's elegant in its simplicity. And it is the so-called experts that have come out and said, you have to have this or else you're going to die. And you have to have that or you're going to die. I don't, uh, that, that doesn't sit with me because, you know, here's the, that's the, the, the dirty little secret. Not everybody in, it, I would say very few people in the deep submersible, deep water exploration community have clean underwear. Everybody has had problems and has had issues. Everyone, every single one. And you learn from your mistakes and you learn from their mistakes and you try not to repeat mistakes. So, well, we're not talking about grandma's drive to the grocery store here. Exactly. It's not no. the slingshot ride at the on the at the state fair. Yeah, I mean, it, it, uh, this is high risk, high reward stuff, and I I think a lot of Americans sort of treated it as the, uh, during the second guessing phase, as mm -hmm. if you know we were as if Krista McAuliffe didn't die because some little uh, little rubber part froze. Yeah, exactly. You know? Uh, and and not just Krista, obviously. No, but but you're right, Wayne. It's it's it, it is it is so easy to second guess. It is so easy, you know. I, I'm I've been doing it for two months, but I I wouldn't have done it. I would have done it rapidly on the morning of June 18th and made a decision. I always make a decision about whether I'm going to dive on the day of, not. The night, sometimes the night before, but rarely. But I would have done the checklist in my head and the assessment in my head, and I would have talked to PH again, and I would have talked to Stockton again privately, and I would have made up my mind. Um, and it's it, it's it's really amazing to me now. You, you know, I'll give you an example. People think it's a stupid idea to be bolted into the sub. Who else had a sub where they were bolted in? Well, Jim Cameron, and you know, that's the that's what was done for a long time. I was actually surprised to see the bolts. I didn't. Uh, I never saw the sub until I got to the ship two years ago, for mission one, year one, and then I saw that it was bolted, and I I didn't like it, and I was really kind of there are a couple of things I didn't like about it, but I that was one of them. So, you know, we worked on people are bolted in. What if there's a fire? We've got this method, to, this mitigation, this mitigation, this mitigation. Um, you know, it just, if you were, you know, Stockton felt, and, you know, it's a shame because those of us that knew him, you either liked him or you didn't. There was no kind of in between. I liked him. Mm -hmm. Um, I I felt as though you know there's a saying just because you're paranoid it doesn't mean the world's not out to get you the criticisms that he was facing it was really interesting to be there in 2018 for example um, if you spoke to somebody in the deep submersible or deep water community this thing was a death trap, you were going to die. You can't make a sub out of carbon fiber. You can't make it as an, in a cylinder. It has to be a sphere. If you spoke to somebody in the aviation industry, this was great. You were going to be, this was awesome. This and Why didn't anybody think of this earlier? So there was that. And then if you drilled down and you talked to the people that really knew, they would, you you they would have different opinions many were neutral many were not they were negative um and a few were positive but when you looked at the negatives and i know all these people you started to see like you ask yourself who is biased who has a neutral who has an opinion that's neutral that's the person i want to listen to and that was ph Narjale for me 
who has an opinion that's biased? Is it biased in favor or biased? Why is it biased? Are you a, oh, you're a competitor. Oh, you got passed over for something. Oh, you um, are dishonest anyway. And there are people that are on the negative side that one person in particular, I wouldn't trust him if he told me the sky was blue. And then, and then, and Stockton could sort these out. And to his credit, Stockton did seek out advice from pretty much anybody. He would listen to anybody and he would offer, you know, one of the reasons why he didn't do certification was because there were the, the, ABS and and the other class society didn't have any standards for a cylindrical sub or a carbon fiber sub that would go to this depth. They just didn't have them. Uh So there was no certification system to go through. There was no certification to test against. And what would have to happen would be that Stockton would have to give all of his intellectual property to this class societies and teach them about this design and get them to accept it and sign off on it. He didn't feel the need because he was doing the testing. He was seeking outside input. So he wasn't just living in an echo chamber. He was, he was doing the things that the class society, he would have to pay the class society to build the testing system to test his, you know, he was doing all that. So you had two sides to the start argument. And in my opinion, they were both correct. They were, they both were right. And the higher the volume got on one side, the higher the volume got on the other side. And it up and up and up. And what I saw were people that were turning their back on Stockton and and not willing to help him for whatever reasons they had. And I felt as though I'm not going to do that. I know that there's five ways to die in the sub. We're only talking about one. And that somebody's going to get in that sub and go down. And to the extent I can help this person or I can change their mind, I'm going to try. And so that I viewed was was my role. And sometimes I was successful and sometimes I wasn't. But at the end of the day, and and, and my role was more critical in year one on site, which was 2021, than since. They didn't ask me for much advice over the last year, nor did they really need it. But you know that that was that was the that was the situation in 2018. I never knew about the David Lockridge lawsuit, for example. I pulled all the pleadings today and read them. I wish I had known about David's. I know David. I dove with David. I wish I had known about this in 2018. Kind of like I wish I was on the boat. But I, what bothers me about David's case is it was over in a flash. It was over and done in four months. They settled it. They didn't say what they settled it for. Now they do. Now, now it's come out that, you know, David went to OSHA. David went to the, the Coast Guard and nothing came of it. And there was a lawsuit filed and nothing came of it. And he made allegations that actually Ocean Gate never answered before the case was resolved. And it was at a time when they were testing the sub. You know, I, I, the David's David's concerns that he expressed were with the first version of Titan, which was decommissioned. It wasn't the sub that imploded. Oh. And a lot of what David raised was corrected in version two. But version one still made 48 dives. It still made three dives to the depth of the Titanic three more dives to what I consider deep water, deeper than any of the other competitors had ever been. And six dives to what I consider to be the deep ocean. And that hasn't been told. And when the, there was eventually a delamination of that hull and the acoustic monitoring system that Stockton believed in to, to his death did its job. 
and it gave them plenty of warning and they came up and I'm sure they weren't happy about it at the time. I wouldn't have been. And, but the hull was delaminating and they came up the, from the depth of the Titanic for testing in the Bahamas, tore the whole thing apart, saw what had happened and what, and fixed it in version two. And then version two had made 13 dives to the Titanic and, and the, the, whole monitoring system actually worked now did that create confirmation bias where it confirmed what i thought I, I trusted it it worked it told me gave me plenty of warning and i was able to get back to the surface safely yes the the uh dome the i never knew about the dome apparently not being i mean the, the viewport not being tested below 1200 meters and i read today that it wasn't tested to below 1200 meters because they didn't test to depth below 1200 meters. That's why I was only certified to 1200 meters. I knew nothing about this until after Titan was lost, but uh, all right. So you test to a certain depth. You don't test beyond that. Then how can you say it can't go beyond that? I also, why would you say it can go beyond that? That's an equally plausible question, but Titan one still made at least six dives below the depth that that was supposed to have failed without an issue. I don't know if they put a different viewport in Titan II. I just don't know the answer to that. But looking at the records, I don't think that the dome failed. I mean, I'm sorry. I don't think that the viewport, viewport failed. Right. You know? So it's a legitimate thing to raise and, and address and, and make sure you have answers to. Uh, at the end of the day, I would be very surprised if that was the reason why we lost the sub, but or they lost the sub. I say now, we well, say family because they were close. They have uh, 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 sufficient yeah. wreckage to check that. Uh, I know it was recovered, and I'm not certain that they do have enough. Yeah, to check. Um, but at, at the very least, uh, I think the 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 fact that uh, in an earlier version uh, they had this uh, this warning about delamination that caused them to return to the surface and confirmed that the system that they had designed to indicate if there was a problem with that worked worked that day. So they weren't, it wasn't as if they were sloppy about that. Right. It's, you know, even if, even if it was an issue of delamination, um, they at least may, uh, had, had a rational reason for expecting that it would, that it, it would function okay. Right. And, and then David's, David's claims against Oceangate, he said, well, that's not enough. You need to test it to failure. And you need to scan the hull with non-destructive scanning. Well, the response to that was, there's no scanning device that, w that it will fit into. So great idea, but there's no capability to do it. And I, and that's what they said. I don't know if that's true, but that's what they said. And they, they did test it to failure. They actually, that's what they made 48 dives for. They tested it until it failed. And they were in it when, it, when the delamination occurred. And they know why it was delaminated and they, they work those bugs out in version two. So I would, I would assume that the expectation was that the, the hull, every hull has a, has a shelf life. It has a number of mm -hmm. uh, dives it can do. I would assume that they believed that it would, or Stockton or people at Ocean Gate believed that they had not, were not approaching that because he, as David Pogue said, and he's absolutely correct, Stockton didn't want to die. And Stockton didn't want to kill anybody. He wasn't suicidal. He wasn't homicidal at all. He was he was a, a risk taker, but he, he didn't intend to kill anyone. I know that for for a fact because he was he did everything possible to not die and make sure that everybody understood the risks that they were facing, including that you will die. And you know, there's a lot of complaining about the liability waiver which says you, the word death three times on the first page. 
I'm very fond of that liability waiver. I am, I didn't write it, but I certainly reviewed it. And I, there's no ambiguity at all. And I gave the safety briefing on the first year, first mission, and part, I added to what Stockton said. And I said, listen, do you understand that you could die today? There's two cameras. We filmed every one of them. Don't mumble. Use your words. Say yes or no. Look into the camera and, and say yes or no. And there's no shame. And Stockton, we, we have a recording of the briefing where he said, look, if you don't want to go, we want test pilots. We don't want, we don't want passengers. We don't want pilots. We want people that are willing to be test pilots, but you could die. And if you don't want to go, that's fine. That's great. We'll work it out. You can, we'll refund or, or do something else. And there's no pressure, no shame in it. If you don't want to go, you don't have to go. But if you do go, you do have to understand the risk and, and, you know, look into the camera and say yes or no, not just write your name on a piece of paper. And, and so that's an important part of this. It's that nobody was misled. Stockton didn't believe in, in, in class certification. And he put the reasons why on the Ocean Gate website in 2019. They were there for everybody to read. It was a controversy. People were, were you know, he had passengers that paid and then pulled out because it wasn't class certified. And there was a lawsuit by a husband and wife because of it. And he's his defense of it was you knew that i told you that it's on the website it's not a secret it's been talked about for years and now you just you just didn't go and and so it's uh my view is david personal view if you're going to take a risk you should assess the risk and if for whatever reason you you decide that that's too much for you, then don't do it. And don't fool yourself and don't fool your spouse and don't fool your kids. It's, I have, I, my law practice focuses primarily on the trial side of it on, on uh, defending scuba diving fatalities and, and, and wrongful death cases and people that, that die. And I have done hundreds and hundreds of, of scuba fatality investigations and other types of fatality investigations. And I know why people die. And there's actually a saying in my office when a new call comes in, which is basically every Monday from May to October. And someone's got to be the first to say, he was the best diver I ever saw. Because that's what the husbands tell the wives. This is easy. There's no risk. Don't worry, honey. I, I'm, you go. Uh, I'm going to go diving with the guys today. And it's perfectly safe. And I meticulously maintain my equipment. And I'm not going to do anything dangerous. And then they die and the, their their family members are left saying, but he said it was safe and it was, he, and he maintains his equipment meticulously and yada, yada. And then I have to be the one to sit there and say, well, the oxygen sensors and the rebreather have to be replaced every 12 months. They cost about $50 and these are three years old. And that means they fail and they don't fail in a linear way. They just fail. And that means he's not going to get oxygen. Sorry, that's why we tell you to change them every year. And this is very, very, very common. So it's a, my perspective is you tell people everything, everything. Don't hold anything back. Don't sugarcoat it. Don't say it's a little safe. It's not safe. And you have to mitigate against your risks and, and there's nobody forcing you to go. And you couldn't get on this boat and see it in St. John's Harbor with its platform that was sinking and little sub on the back and towing it 400 miles out into the ocean in poor weather and get out to the middle of nowhere and not realize that this is dangerous and this is something that where I may be beyond help. It's not physically possible or mentally possible to do this and not realize that it is incredibly dangerous and you may not survive. It, I, I just, I don't, I, I don't believe that that's possible having done it so many times. Yeah. So where that leads us to Dave is, is, is that 
we live in a society that uh, we try to limit our risks, all of us do, but we also um, idolize those people who step into the breach yeah. and take the risks. Um, and, uh, you know, so here you have that instance, and I want to talk about the importance of continuing to explore and not uh, wrapping ourselves in in bubble wrap uh, for our society. Well, uh, I'm I'm right there with you. I and this is this is the 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 equation that I had in my head, which is I can I have a high tolerance for risk. I've been 16,000 feet deep in the Bermuda Triangle on a Russian submersible and, and we got stuck. Yeah. And I've been stuck in the Titanic. I've I've done these things. I, you know, I ride a motorcycle. I I drive my car 165 miles an hour in a in a charity event here in Sun Valley. I do these things, but I knew if I didn't get in the sub that day that somebody was going to take my seat. And there will always be the human, you know, exploration is curiosity and action. And somebody will be curious enough to say, I'll take that risk. And I think somebody needs to be curious enough to say, I'll take that risk. I mean, was, was it was it Charlie right. Duke that said when he was sitting in the Apollo rocket and it was shaking and it was taking off, all he could think about was this was built by the lowest bidder? <laughs> You know, <laughs> but he's still going to the moon. And, you know, I said, I did this project for Jeff Bezos for the Bezos, uh, where I recovered the Apollo rocket engines. And I, I'm, you'll like this. I <clears throat> collected every single document from the Apollo program that is left. And I, and I, I hunted high and low. When there's a memo from about 1967, it's seven pages long. And the, the issue that they're trying to solve is what happens if one of the F1 engines burps, a million and a half pounds of thrust per engine, seven and a half million pounds of thrust, all going straight up. And if one burped, it would cause an oscillation. This is explained in the first six and three quarter pages. If it's if it burps, it would cause an oscillation and the, the, the rocket's only uh, stable vertically and not horizontally from forces because it's being pushed. So it will cause a an oscillation and uh, the, the the rocket will go sideways and it'll breach and it'll be a catastrophic failure and everybody will die. No one won't have any chance to survive. And then there's the solution. It's one sentence. Don't let that happen. <laughs> <laughs> that was, and that is an official NASA doc engineering study of the problem of what happens if the engine burps. Don't let that happen. Right. And it's an unsolvable problem. That they just, but thank you. Sign off on that. Put it in the file. We looked at it. Next, next issue. Next, yeah, and carry on. And we did it. And and we did it with technology that is embarrassing, right? It's like it's like toothpicks and soup spoons compared to what we have today. But somebody is going to take that risk. Somebody is going to go over Niagara Falls in a barrel. Somebody's going to to climb that mountain. Somebody, because it's there, right? That's what Mallory right. said. Yeah. And it's just human nature to to peek in the under the rug or, or to look behind the boulder or to stand on top of it and see what you can see and to go beyond the edge of the earth, be out there beyond this point, there be dragons. Right? That's what the old maps used to say. Right. And... And see what you can find. And and then I was always asked, what's left to explore when I was at the VP of the Explorers Club? And then the answer is everything. Because the last time we were in some of these places, we had such poor technology that we couldn't document it. And I, I was asked to give Jeff an award. But, uh, uh, Buzz Aldrin was supposed to do it. He didn't show, and I, I had to do it. And I had about three hours to prepare. And I thought, what am I going to say? So I came up with this, this, this analogy, and I said, an adventurer is somebody that goes from here to there and comes back and says, this is what I did. 
An explorer is somebody who goes from here to there and comes back and says, this is what I learned. And that's truly, in my opinion, the definition of an explorer. And people are curious and they want to learn. So they're going to do these things mm -hmm. despite the risks. And it's my job as a lawyer or as a consultant or, or you know, as a human being with, with a brain and a heart to try to mitigate the risks so people don't get hurt. But, you know, I ride motorcycles. I've ridden all through the state of New Hampshire. I shake my head whenever I see a motorcyclist without a helmet. That's not a risk I'm willing to take. I've watched a guy die falling off from in a motorcycle accident when he didn't have a helmet on and otherwise it was survivable and you know i just that's just not something i would do but hundreds of thousands of motorcyclists ride every day without helmets right you know and i i don't think it's the government's job to tell us how to protect ourselves and to ma and mandate bubble wrap and I don't know. I, I, Wayne, I wish I, I knew the answer. All I know is that somebody else would have gotten in that seat that day because of curiosity. And, you know, that's, my... that's ultimately what keeps pushing us forward on the, on the horizon. Isn't right. it? In my view, it is. And, and I say that having done it and I say that, having helped other people do it. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe that we should not learn from our mistakes and try not to repeat our mistakes. I don't believe that we should take risks that are, are, you know, that you, you, that are stupid, really like riding a motorcycle without a helmet. I'll go out on a limb here and say, I think that's stupid, mm -hmm. but I know people don't agree with me and that's not a popular thing to say with some people, but in my view, that's just not, that's not, that that's the risk of an injury is too high. And the, the certainty of an accident is also too high. So those point, those two lines are going to intersect for every motorcyclist. You've either been down or you're going to go down Yeah, and you need to be careful enough to make sure that you can survive it if you want to, you know, um, PH was perfectly happy. I know this because he told me and he told others, he was perfectly happy to, to die in the sub diving in the Titanic. He felt that that was an acceptable, preferable way to go. And his exact words were, I don't want to, I don't want to die in a hospital bed. And that was uh, that was how he felt. So I don't feel bad for PH, really. I'm sorry that he died, but I I know how he felt about dying in that way in that place. And it was it was on his list of things that he would prefer. And I would venture to say that uh, you know of all the folks that uh, you know from the Explorers Club that most of them would say the same thing. That yeah. And most of them have said the same thing. And I've been to a lot of funerals of people who have told me that. And I, it, we, unfortunately, it's not something I, I, uh, we like to talk about. I don't like to talk about, but, uh, but I have lost a lot of friends uh, involved doing exploration and, and I can analytically tell you what the trigger and what, and the, what the first link in the causal chain was and what every other link was thereafter. And that doesn't bring them back, but it all, I, here's the thing. I, I hate the, the, the expression he died doing what he loved so much. I hear it all the time in my work and I hate it so much. And it's just, it's just a lie, but I will say that, a lot of people I know have died um, willing to take the risks that they would die and they have. And it's, 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 it's cold comfort to their wives and children. And it's always the guys, unfortunately, we're not that bright. It, it, it's just, um, they just do. And 
I wish they wouldn't, but they do. And I can't tell them not to. I can only try to help them be more safe. Right. So, David Kincannon, thank you so much for taking the time to to speak with me. It's been uh, really quite interesting to explore all of this with you. And uh, I, I hope we'll have a chance to talk again soon. I know we will. And Wayne, that's why I wanted to talk to you before I spoke to anybody else about this.